What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Couple Things. With Sean and Andrew. A podcast all about couples. And the things they go through. Today, we are so excited about this interview because it's also the welcoming of the newest show to the Family Made team. This show that we're referring to is First Class Fatherhood, brought to you by Alec Lace. Let me give you a little background on Alec Lace. He works a full-time job on the railroad. Yes. He has a side hustle, Ubering. Yes. And then he'll sit down and interview some of the biggest names in Hollywood, across the world, authors, yes. celebrities. We're talking Matthew McConaughey, Steve Harvey, Tony Hawk, Tom Brady, the biggest of the big. This guy will reach out to them himself, mm -hmm. book them on a show, get done with the railroad, sit down with them and interview them. I love his story. I love his perspective. And his whole mission is to empower fathers to re-engage because when a father is active in the family, it changes the whole dynamic. Um, he even goes into this concept and idea that fatherhood doesn't have to be a paternal father. It can be father as in God. It can be a father figure. And really kind of like just growing on this idea that having a father figure in your life to lead you down the right road can actually help with your trajectory of like success and life and happiness and everything. So he's done 636 something episodes yes. on his show where he sits down and talks to people about how they do fatherhood, what they love about it and uh, what they can do better. And he's had hundreds of guests. The perspective that he's gained is fantastic so much so that he's even written a book called first class fatherhood where he writes down and captures some of the biggest things that he's learned. So in this episode, we wanted to sit down and interview Alex so you can get to know him and also play some of our favorite excerpts from his show. But I would encourage you, if you like Alec or the guests he has on, go check out the show yourself. We'll link it down below. It's called First Class Fatherhood. It's on YouTube. It's on anywhere you can find podcasts. And we are so excited to be welcoming him into the Family Made Network um, and super pumped. So I hope you enjoy it. Before we jump into it, please subscribe to this show and give it a rating on whatever platform you're listening on. And go do the same if you go and listen to his stuff. But Alec, thank you for taking the time to sit down with us. Uh, excited to have our interview with him debut on his show. And let's roll into it with Alec Lace. Better way to bring on first class fatherhood than to have Alec, the man behind the show, as well as his son Aiden here. This is fun. It's a real yeah. treat. Thanks for joining, guys. It's an honor to be here with you, Andrew. <laughs> Finally meet you in person. So thanks for having us. It's been a pleasure. This is fun. We did lunch. We drove around town a little bit. I still need to show you Vanderbilt and some of the schools around here. But um, I would love to. We have a special guest, Aiden, here. Tell us about your family, Alec, if you don't mind. What's your wife, what's your kid's situation look like? Absolutely. Yeah, I am a, uh, a married father of four children. My wife and I, Jessica, were married 17 years. We have four kids, three boys, and then we got the girl on the fourth try. If we didn't get her on four, we'd have five by now, but we got her, oh, and that's man. the name of that tune. Aiden's our third son, yeah. uh, and uh, I am a uh, full-time railroad mechanic. I've been doing that for 20, 22, 23 years. Hustle a lot of Uber on the side. I've always done a lot of different uh, side hustles to kind of bring in money and income for the family, especially during them early days. My wife stayed home to raise the kids. My wife now works at a church that we belong to and been doing the podcast for four years now. Started it up at the foot of my bed just with this message because through driving Uber, I would hear so many young men tell me when I said I had four kids, they would look at me like I had four heads and they would be like, why would you ever do that? And they thought of it as something that they would want to put off in life. And so I was trying to like tell these guys, listen, that's the best thing that's ever happened to me when I became a father. So after hearing those messages, I started the podcast First Class Fatherhood to kind of change that mindset in these young men and let them know that there's nothing to be afraid of and that this is something you should embrace. And then it grew to the fact where I was able to bring on a lot of different celebrities and guys who have really just really crushed it in life and have had so much success. But their testimony is that the thing that brought them the most fulfillment was being a father. And those are the stories I try to capture on the show. That's amazing. Uh, and you wrote a book about it as well. Which You're in it. Well, <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that. I'm, I'm honored to just know you. It's been so cool. Alec has this amazing quality of connecting people. And it's, it seems like Aiden is the same way. Um, I am curious just because he's here. Besides being your absolute mini-me and look-alike, what quality do you think you share with your dad, Aiden, most? Uh, well, definitely being able to talk to people in a good way is one of them. Um, I'd say we're both very good at things like playing video games. 
You're a, a gamer. I, I, I'm oh, yeah. not a gamer, but I can rock the okay. game. We, we can play okay. some Modern Warfare together, and we can we can rack up some kills. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and you're both Bengals fans. Yeah, we're both yes. Bengals. Both Bengals. Okay. Good day. Yeah, jeez. Well, it was good. It was a good year for the boys. But um, so, okay, you mentioned that fatherhood shouldn't be something to be intimidated by. How do you view fatherhood, Alec, yourself? Well, fatherhood for me, it, it was a. Um, I would say it's where I really felt like I became a man when I became a father. So for me, all of the things that seemed so important before I became a dad started to seem so trivial to where I put so much emphasis emphasis on them. And it really, and I know one of the things, Andrew, is people are afraid to have kids because they think it costs so much money. How are you going to be able to afford it? And in my opinion, kids motivate you to want to bring in more income like you've never had before. Like it's this sense of like a need to provide for your family. So it really gives you the extra incentive to earn more money. So those are things that really started to awaken in me as I became a father. And now it, it's, it's everything to me. It, it, nothing matters more in my life than my wife and my children. And we eat together, we pray together and uh, we're, we're a close family. We have our bouts, we have our disagreements, we work through it. And I, and I love being a dad. It is amazing. We hosted a friend in town who's who's uh, in his mid thirties, lives in Los Angeles, like really pursuing his ambitions, and he seems a little skittish about having kids because he thinks it's he, he thinks it's going to derail him from like achieving the goals that he has in life. And it's so interesting, like the the perspective change that you get when you have kids uh, is unlike any other, and it reprioritizes things. You're like, oh wow, I wanted to travel the world. Now Sean and I don't want to ever travel again. We want to be in our living room with our kids. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, oh, I wanted to build a company that had whatever, how many, however many people. And it's like, no, I want to spend time with my kids and cook dinner with them and pray with them at night, you know, put them to bed every night. So, And, and especially, too, if you have a friend group and you're the ones that are having kids and the friend group isn't, you'll notice that distance right away because yeah. they don't get it. And it's, yeah. not, it's not something you can understand from reading a book. It's something that has to be experienced in order for you to understand it. So that's one of the things that separates. You don't distance yourself from your friends, but it's, it's not as important anymore to do these things that you used to do. And, and you're not even, you don't even feel guilty about not doing it because you're so involved in what you're doing now. Do you feel like, okay, so your oldest is seven, 16, seven, 16. Okay, yeah. 16. Have you always maintained this perspective on fatherhood of like really – being excited about it or has that been an evolution in of itself it keeps it interesting because i've never had a 16 year old son before yeah, yeah. you know so he turned 16 he's just going to get his driver's permit i've never that's something i've never had to experience as a dad is a, a, a child who drives a child who dates a child who does uh, what goes to college or so there's so many things i haven't experienced yet as a dad and i always make the point too to say like I'm by no means the best father in the world or view myself that way. I, I feel like I'm a dad that's still in the game, that's learning the game. I learned from others who have been there. Part of the beauty of having people on the show that are grandfathers, a lot of them, I get a chance to ask them, hey, how did you deal with it when your son started dating? What did you do when your daughter became old enough and guys started coming to the house? So I get to listen to these perspectives, and everyone has a little bit of a different take, so it kind of helps me prepare myself for that next level. But, yeah, it keeps it interesting. My oldest son... He's, like I said, we call him Checkmate Charlie. He's a chess whiz. He's a calculus guy, a math guy, something I'm not into. He's a unique person. He's, he's, he's somebody that I'm getting to know along with him growing. My middle son, he's the gamer. Uh, my little mini-me guy here. Uh, you know, Everyone has their own interests. My daughter is a completely different and unique individual. So getting to learn about them really reveals more about myself. You know, So that's really the fun of it. Aiden, we were talking about some of your interests earlier, yeah. what you like to read and stuff. What, yeah. what are you into? Um, well, reading, I really like the non-fiction, uh, yeah, non, I mean, fiction books. Yeah. Yeah. Um, gaming is a big one. I'll watch TV. I'll, I like going outside, uh, shadow boxing, you know, working out, stuff like shadow that. Shadow box? Do you yeah, shadow box? Doing Not as much as I should, but yeah, that was <laughs> a big thing I used to do. Yeah. Yeah. What's, what's the one thing, uh, you're most thankful for with what your dad does and how he's raised you? Well, him, t uh, him and mom taking care of me when I'm sick, and them taking us places. Uh, they when they they listen to us. If there's something that we need, or if there's just something that we need, and if we need help, they'll always come to us. They're very helpful, and yep. they're very kind. We like to help Matt once in a while. <laughs> 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 it's funny. Uh, Seeing you with your son being here in Nashville, I know it's like a, a trip, a getaway with with you two. It brings me uh, back to when I was like 11 or 12. My dad took me on, 
I think in my whole childhood, we went on two one-on-one trips and just how special that time can be, you know, there at home, there's a bunch of chaos. There's always divided attention. You got kids or whatever the normal responsibilities, but that time away when it's just like, you could sit in the hotel room all day if you wanted to and just hang out. Uh, it's, it's super special. So it's it, fun to see it. It's so important when you have four kids that, that, that one-on-one time, man, and to us, it may seem irrelevant, but to them, it could be the whole, the whole day, the whole week, even if it's just a walk to the bodega or if it's just a ride to the store, whatever it may be, I'll try to pick one a child to bring with me on a trip just so we have that one-on-one time or that one connection. And, you know, sometimes we, we look at it as like, it's no big deal in our life or, oh man, if I have to bring them, it's going to be, I have to slow down. I have to do this. But if you just looking at it from their perspective, it's really a big deal. Like I got that one-on-one time with that. It's important. Yeah. It's awesome. Um, so you've interviewed, I mean, you're at episode 630, whatever right now on your show, you've interviewed a ton of different people and really have this unique insight because of, you know, there's very few people on the planet who like focus on fatherhood as much as you have. So you don't have any fancy licenses or degrees or whatever specific to this, but you have maybe the the most exposure to this subject matter of anyone out there. What, what are some of the limiting factors for, okay, I'm a dad. Why, well, what resources or accountability or community, like what can help me be a better dad? Well, I would hope listening to first class fatherhood (laughs) and reading the book would do that. But you know what it is? It's being able to talk to people like anything else, find somebody that's had some success in your area and mimic them. The success leaves clues. It's the same thing with fatherhood. And you know, fatherhood is something you you spent four years going to college, right? You study a certain subject. If you're going to play a sport, you focus on studying and training. You don't just show up and start playing it. If you're going to be a doctor, you go through 10 years of law school and a hundred million bucks before you get to do your first (laughs) surgery, right? Fatherhood isn't like that. You don't go through an eight month course or a four year class. You're father on day one. And now that's it. So it's, it's this on the job learning experience and it keeps it fresh because even though we're all fathers, we all have a different experience in it. So when you bring on different guys, they've done things in different ways. It's hit them differently. Uh, people, depending on what part of their life they're in, they become a father. They have a different story than everybody else. So it, we're very unique. I mean, there's there's 9 billion people on the planet, but there's only one Andrew East. And that's it. You're a unique individual, you know. So you're going to have a unique experience. And to, to, to get a chance to capture that from all these different dads has been incredible. And I know it's helped so many guys. I get the emails, and that's the best part of it, getting emails from guys who will reach out to me and say, man, I love what you're doing. It makes me feel like I'm doing a better job as a father. I'm worried about, you know how it is. You worry as a dad, if you're doing the right thing, if am I doing, am I being the best dad that I can be? And sometimes you need that reassurance and it's helpful to talk to other fathers. Yeah. So you've interviewed some massive names on your show. Uh, It's impressive how, how connected you have become over the past four years of you doing the show. And one of the things that stood out to me is in your interview with Matthew McConaughey, just to hear his take on how important the role of being a father is, um, was, I felt like so impressive. And he mentions how it's not just like a, Hey, you're a father, the baby comes, you have, you have the baby and you're done. It's like a very active, engaged thing. And that really stood out to me. I know we're all talking about the COVID. One of the, one of the epidemics we got going is what you just brought up. We've had it going for a while fatherless. Look, we all got to understand more people have to understand that. Um, fatherhood's a verb. It ain't like you helped make the baby and then you did it. And now you're a father. Oh, now the work just begins. And so if we're going to say, let's just say for stereotypes, we're going to keep our ch- child's are going to stay in our house till they're 18 on average. All right. It's 18 years of hard, good, work to be a father. You can't just say, oh, I'm a father and, and be and be a, and be a no show just because you made the baby. No, you may be uh, a daddy, but you, you had, you're not the father yet. The fatherhood takes work. Yeah, I, I loved having Matthew on the yeah, show yeah. and I, I really consider him and I say it to him. I consider him like an ambassador for fatherhood. And that's something I preach is about being an ambassador for fatherhood, uh, telling these young guys uh, about how, how important it is. And I focus a lot on the fatherless crisis that we have going on in our country. And in my opinion, it's the number one social issue we have in our country. We're trying to solve all these other social issues, but at the core of our entire country is the family unit. And when you lose the country, when you lose the family, you lose the country. And Dang. so it's so important to get the dads involved. And Matthew McConaughey called it an epidemic and then went into a piece that I thought was beautiful on the show. Yeah. I, I, the fatherless epidemic was the one part of that that really stood out to me. And it's like jarring. It's like, wow, 
you know, we, we've, we're all familiar with this other type of epidemic that we've all been exposed to or pandemic, whatever you want to call it. But what is the cause of, of this fatherless epidemic as you see it? Well, uh, there's three, three major factors into this, Andrew. Number one, you saw the shift in the 60s with the welfare system that started to reward moms for not having a man in the home. So it was the no man at home. And so people were starting to get almost, in a sense, rewarded for not having a man living in the home. You could see, if you look back into the 50s, you go back then, the, the two-parent households, the fatherless rate was like maybe 9%. It's tri- over, tripled to today. And so you started to see that happening in the 60s. And another major, major contributing factor to this is the divorce uh, family court system in this country, which is really, I know I had Greg Ellis from the Pirates of the Caribbean. I know D- Johnny Depp was the big one in the news, but this guy, Greg Ellis, who was on all the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, he calls it the family court cartel. And in a world where we want everything to be equal, in the eyes of the family court, it's not equal. It's heavily leveled against fathers. And that has been a big, big problem where so many guys become financially strapped. They become humiliated. They lose everything, all to fight for a small piece of custody with their children. And some of them just put their hands up and walk away. And there's way too many of that. And also, you throw in the mix, we have deadbeat dads in the country. Those are the three major determining factors and why there's so few dads that are involved in their kids' lives. And it really is uh, an epidemic. So describe to me the, the brighter future, the better future in your perfect world, what is what does it look like when fathers are engaged with their family? Well, you, you, all aspects of our society are going to improve if that's the case, and I think it can be done. And I, 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 I have solutions in mind for that too. But if you look at all of the statistics that are crippling our country, if you look at the suicide rate among youths, if you look at the teenage pregnancy, if you look at the incarceration rates. And I always, I never take away from single moms. And sometimes I get this and it's not an attack on single moms. There's a lot of single moms that work miracles out there and I have nothing but respect for them. And I'm not saying that if a child grows up without a father, he's going to end up in prison. But 85% of the youths that are sitting in a prison right now had no father in the home. So if you could start to get those numbers down, if you look at rapes, assaults, you look at every, every one of the categories, it all correlates to not having a dad in the home. And Andrew, it also goes the reverse way. If you look at the the demographics, the four biggest demographics in this country, right? Asian, Caucasian, Hispanic, and African-American. If you look at the top earners in this country, it's Asian, Caucasian, Hispanic, African-American. And if you look at the fatherless households, the number one fatherless household, African-American, then Hispanic, Caucasian, and Asian has mm-hmm. the lowest amount of fatherless homes, and they dominate in the categories of all of the ones that I just mentioned. So it matters, and the proof is really there if, if you look at it. So if we can get a control on that, get more dads engaged in their kids' lives, all of these things are going to improve, and our society is going to be much better, much stronger, and a much better place to live. It is it is amazing to think. Uh, I was just researching marriage, and the like. What are, what are the actual benefits of marriage? Just like beyond you know the, the mushy, like, oh, you're in love. You, or your whole life, whatever. And there's like tangible health benefits to staying married, which, you know, plays into being an active father, I think in, in a lot of ways. Um, and, and, you know, the, just the family unit on so many different levels from a societal standpoint does make an impact. It's amazing. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, uh, like what do you do actively with your kids like Aiden, um, to, to really like step in and, and, and impact them. Like what are just some of the, the day in day out routines? Aiden, feel free to chip in. I'm curious to hear your perspective on this, but like, what are I, your rhythms? I, I would say some of those things, right? Like you could say about pizza day, something like that. Right. Yeah. And, uh, I've always been a class parent for the kids in their school and there's not many dads. And one thing you notice when you do, if you're any of the dads that are out there listening, if you're a class parent, you'll notice you may be the only one that's doing that in the class. So I, I've always tried to do that where I've been involved in their schools. Yeah. He's, he's always there. We, uh, every week at my school, we have a, we have a pizza day and he's always there giving kids pizza. He'll say something to the kids. He'll say something like to my friends and my friends will come up to me. Aiden, your dad just told me to say three Hail Marys before I eat my pizza. It's <laughs> awesome. Uh, yeah, sometimes yeah. what they'll try to do is if uh, a lot of the, they'll pull a cute move and they'll, on the slip, their parent had circled water and they try to get a Sprite. And I'm like, hey, that's okay. Get the water and say two Hail Marys when you sit down and eat your pizza. Like, but I do the pizza day, so I show up. And then after I serve the pizza with the rest of the moms, I'll sit at his table and, and talk to his friends and get involved in the conversation. I do the same for my daughter. 
I sit down and, and have conversation with them, and it's hilarious, and I love it. So it's just trying to be involved any way I can. Just our conversation at lunch, if you don't mind me sharing some of the things I picked up. Uh, so you kind of, it seems like, have the option to work other shifts in what you do, but you've chosen to work 7 p.m. to 3 a.m. Do I have that right? Yep. You work the night shift, and you work or you sleep from 5 a.m. to 10 a.m. AM. So you, I guess you miss the kids going away to school, but the benefit is you pick them up at 2 PM, you cook them dinner at four 30 or whatever, or you coach them until, until then. And you put them to bed at night, which is, uh, or we you, I guess you go together. to, yeah, you eat dinner together, which is, which is incredible. And I just think about, I, I haven't really been there yet with my kids, but the one thing that I've heard, uh, in my conversation with other fathers is not, it's not, you don't have to do anything spectacular. You just have to be there, right? And it's the time that matters. And so I think about you being so intentional and making, you know, making it work in whatever way you have to, whether that be an, be an Uber driver while you're also recording 636 episodes of podcasts, while you're also working a full-time job, while you're also cooking dinner every night. It's like, it's amazing. And I want to like give, I want to give you all the credit because you deserve it. Um, but I, I just really respect and admire what you've done and how intentional you've been with your family. I appreciate that, Andrew. I j- just wanted to say, too, it, it helps when you make the schedule work for you rather than let the schedule run you. You know, you got to run the schedule. And, you, and yes, the railroad does offer the opportunity to shwi- switch shifts, yeah, yeah. and I picked one that works for me. Which is working Seven at through night, the, three in through the, morning, the yes. night, <laughs> which just seems... Like, that's a sacrifice, you know? I guess so, but I've been doing different shifts my whole life. So, like, the whole day doesn't – my day is different than everybody else's. Like, I'm not on the same clock as everybody else. So, uh, I, I, whatever my shift is going to be, I make it work for me. You, you really got to be intentional about your schedule, and it's really important to get things done. So, you had Steve Harvey on your show, and he has a, a really strong opinion on, on how large of a role playing uh, – or being a father – uh, plays in a person's life as well. And I really understood what love was, but at my father's funeral, I was sitting there and I was looking at him laying up there, man. And when I got on the plane to go back to LA, I said to myself, man, what do young boys and what do young men do who don't have this guy that I had? Because he was one of the sole reasons I had become a success because he kept me on track. And I said, wow, when a, when a young boy doesn't have a father, what does he do? How, do, how does he get to where he wants to go? Because if I, I was clearly looking at my father's funeral, realizing that without this dude, I'm not here today. And that's what started the foundation work. With my, I, I feel so fortunate that I guess it's kind of like a luck of the draw. My dad was super hands-on. He was at every practice. He would record all of our games. Like he'd be up in the, the media stand with a, with a handheld camcorder recording it but not everybody has that benefit. Right. And so I'm curious what your relationship with your dad was like, did you start all these traditions or like, did, was this, are you ground zero for what you want your family from here on out, like growing from, or, or how did that start? Yeah. I'm, I'm definitely a different father than my dad was. Uh, my dad was a used car salesman in the Bronx his whole life. He had me late in the game. He was 50 years old when he had me. I was the la- I'm the last of seven in a blended marriage. Uh, My mother was 43 when she had me. So I came along late in the game. My parents were already seasoned parents at that time, had raised kids that had moved out. So I got a kind of different version of my dad than my older brothers did. And he brought a different, um, you know, it's different when you go to school and my dad is old enough to be my friend's dad's dad. You know, he could be their grandfather. So he brought a different perspective. His And, And one thing too, Andrew, from interviewing all these people, and it's true with myself, the way that parents disciplined growing up then was a lot different than it is now. Whenever I yeah. ask and I ask all the dads, hey, what kind of disciplinarian are you? And is it different than the discipline style you grew up with? 95% of them will say, oh, it's much different than how I grew up. <laughs> I grew up with the belt or I grew up with a switch. <laughs> right? and, and they'll say, but I don't do that to my kids. And, uh, and, and that's, that's true of me too. I, I, I'm, I'm not a physical parent the way that my father was. And it wasn't because he was a, a bad dad or that's what you knew of how to parent. So I think things like that are definitely different. And, but I think the, the, the communication, I think, is just the same. I could talk to my father about anything, and that was true up until the day he died. I was able to speak to him about anything that I wanted to, and I'm hoping to develop that relationship with my kids, that part of it where even when they know that they're in trouble and they've done wrong, that they can come to me and say, hey, uh, I'm, I'm in trouble here and I need some help. I, I want that 
more than I want anything else. It's easy to tell dad about the good things that are happening. It's hard when you're embarrassed and you're ashamed. And I want to make sure that door is open like it was for me. So speaking of making changes, you've made several in your life. If you don't mind us talking about some, we were just on the way here talking about the uh, perspective change that I guess happened a couple. When, when did that happen? Your, your mind shift change. Uh, it happened in 2000, I would say 18, right. Or at the end of 2017, beginning of 2018. And uh, you know, I started reading a lot of different, and that really is what helped me starting to read. And, and, and especially like um, as a man thinketh, think and grow rich, certain different personal development type books that started to open my mind up to different possibilities and different ways of living. Because a lot of the times growing up, I was always this person that thought, yeah, I'll believe it when I see it. And my mindset shifted to once I believe it, then I'll see it. And I started to shift. I got into my Bible more. I got into reading more and more about the New Testament. I started reading more and more books, getting more information and realizing there's this whole different. And part of the thing, a lot of the truth is, Andrew, is I blamed everything and everybody for what was going on in my life except myself. I never put myself on the blame list, whether that was with uh, mm-hmm. drugs and alcohol, whether that was with gambling. Every, every problem that I was having, I always pushed it out to blame something else. And the minute I started to point that finger inside towards me was I'd be able to start healing it and starting to make some real positive changes in my life. And it really, it really catapulted my life, man, into an amazing way. I'm sitting here with you uh, right now talking about this stuff. So it's, it's been a, a pretty dynamic shift. How has that believe it and then you'll see it mentality affected your parenting? Well, I, I think just like it affects everything else in my life, I have more faith and more trust in what is actually happening in the moment and not being um, um, so concerned about um, what is going to happen as a result of this. A- easy way, to, I know, it, just to kind of give an explanation, is the story of the Chinese farmer, right, where uh, th- this guy uh, he has a horse and it runs away and everybody comes. Alan Watts tells this story. People listening that have, that have heard it before, but people come over and say, oh, man, what a shame your horse ran away. And he says, ah, maybe. The next day, the horse comes back and brings seven horses with him. Mm-hmm. And they say, oh, wow, what luck. And he says, maybe. Then the next day, his son is training the horse, <laughs> yeah. and the son falls off the horse and breaks his leg. And everyone says, oh, man, what a shame. Your son broke his leg. He says, maybe. Then the next day, the army comes to sign people up from the army, and they reject his son because he's got a broken leg. And everyone says, wow, what luck. And he says, maybe. Yeah. So you never know what are the actual circumstances of what's happening right now in the moment that it's going to lead to in the future. All we can see right now is the monetary changes. And I keep that in mind when things are happening with my kids. And when I notice maybe they're failing, there's a reason for why it's, I don't know if it's going to bring good consequences or bad ones. All I know is how my reaction right now is going to make a difference. So I'm very cautious about how I react to things when it's happening in their life. It is. uh, I I understood this maybe four years ago. The, the idea that, um, how you perceive life is really kind of a choice, right? Like there, obviously there's a million things that happen that are outside of our control, the horse running away or whatever it is, but how your perception on that event is, is up to you. Right. And it's like, that's such a trivial cliche thing to say, but when you understand that it actually changes everything. And I think, I mean, that is the importance derivative effect. I feel like of, of faith and Christianity where it's like, Oh, there's always, there's always hope. And, uh, that, that has drastically impacted the decisions that I make and how I approach life. And how, when I, when I'm hit with an obstacle, like, Hey, am I going to let this derail me completely? Or is this, this just like a, Oh, this might be a bet. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Jocko Willink, the Navy SEAL talks about that as calling it good. Like he always says, you know, good. When somebody says they have a problem, it gives them the yeah. opportunity to look at it for a solution. Wayne Dyer calls this, when you change the things you look at, the things you look at start to change. And, and it's all true. And when you actually apply this in life, uh, it works. And I, and, and I think a part of my own story really, and a lot of people ask me, how have you got this guest or how have you been able to, you know, get to the Super Bowl and do all these different things? And I always tell them to read Mark eleven twenty four, which says, whatsoever you ask for in prayer, believe you have received it and it will be yours. And then John also backs this up. And this changed my entire way of praying, the t- entire way I look at prayer. When you read the epistle of John, he's, it says, this is the confidence that we should have when we pray, that when we pray, we know that God hears us. And if we know that he hears us, 
we know we already have what it is that we've asked for. And can you believe it? Can you have the faith to believe it? I took a shot, and I had the faith to believe it. And I went from a kid who got a lifetime ban from Giant Stadium to being invited by the NFL to be on the floor at the Super Bowl talking to the greatest player that ever played the game about fatherhood and a subject that I'm really passionate about. So I know it works. I know that the mindset shift helps, and I'm putting my faith, my trust in God. It's proven to be very beneficial. Jeez, it's amazing. Let's take a break to thank some of our partners for today's podcast. Today's podcast is brought to you by one of our favorites, Modern Fertility. You know the coolest thing about Modern Fertility, babe? What? You can get information about your health without even having to go to the doctor. That's right. It's an easy and affordable way to test your fertility hormones at home with a single finger prick. Mail it in with a prepaid label and you'll get your personalized results within 10 days. And here's what you do get. You'll get insight into your hormone levels, your ovarian reserve, aka how many eggs you have compared to other women your age, and other important fertility factors. The results go deep into what every hormone means. And you can also talk one-on-one with a fertility nurse to review your results and options for next steps been really great for us as we think about our family growing you think you have any more eggs in there <laughs> uh we're finding out <laughs> very <Yeah>. soon <laughs> give me 10 more days um but right now modern fertility is offering our listeners 20 dollars off the test when you go to modernfertility.com slash east fam that means your test will cost 139 dollars instead of the hundreds or even thousands it could cost at a doctor's office get 20 dollars off your fertility test when you go to modernfertility.com forward slash east fam Let's get back to it. Speaking of Jocko, the book, his book, Extreme Ownership, man, like that, that's another one that, that shook me. Whereas it's so easy to point the fingers ever, as you were describing everywhere else. But then once you're like, Hey, what can I do about this? What, what role did I play in this? That's what being a man is. And that's what, like being a dad. It's just sometimes you suck it up, take it in the face and say, all right, I did. I made a mistake. Let's move forward. Just stop with the excuses, really. Because <laughs> yeah. all it is, it's like all your excuses are BS. And Jocko, yeah. I loved having Jocko on the show. That was yeah. a real highlight for me, too, because I'm I'm a big fan of his, and he's inspired millions of people all over the world. So to have him on the show was it was intimidating for me. Like I felt like he was gonna come through the screen and choke me, like if I didn't <laughs> if I asked him the wrong question. Like, but but just as much as he comes off that way, he's such an intelligent and well thought out in his responses. It was really, really cool to, to talk to him. Aiden, is the podcast a source of conversation among you and your peers at school, or is it like, do people know about it? Oh, yeah. uh, One of my friends, uh, he sent me a picture of him at uh, Barnes & Noble next to a pile of my dad's books. Oh, wow. Yeah. Hopefully it wasn't in a clearance rack. (laughs) 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 Uh. Yeah. All my friends, I'll t- like one of my friends. He's into wrestling, uh, and I'll tell him he had some like AJ Styles or Edge. You'll tell me, I was wow, that's crazy. Your dad talked to that guy. Yeah. My friends find it really cool. Some of my friends find it really cool. It is interesting. I've thought many times about what effect will Sean being an Olympian or you know us creating all these videos have on our kids. It seems like it's been pretty positive for at least this one so far. But, yeah, it, it's yeah. fun. My family is my biggest support, Andrew. They're the biggest supporters of the podcast, you yeah. know, so they're always, uh, even when I'm having my own doubts about anything that I'm doing, they're always there to help me, you know, and, and, and they've been the best support system ever. That's awesome. Well, it's fun. It's fun to, to meet you guys. I hope to meet more in the future. Um, Tony Hawk was another one, another interview you did that I wanted to talk about. Um, he talked about values and what he wanted to instill in his kids. Oh, um, I, I think, uh, having accountability, um, and being responsible and, and I mean, you know, it's all, it all seems cliche, but making, making good choices, if, if nothing else, that's what I hope that I've led them by example with is making good choices and, um, for them to also take time for themselves, you know, to, to not just be so hyper-focused on work or on, um, on goals and to to goof around i mean that you know as as silly as that sounds that keeps your mental health so much in check with them i mean that's the, you know that's that's what i try to <laughs> that's usually where i find my balance is is just kind of doing doing stuff with them you, you know however however um playful or uh or what seems like a waste of time to have time with them is never a waste of time Sean and I went through this whole process of like, you know, people say, oh, you need to set values and, and it helps you establish a rudder for how you go about life. 
we our process for doing that was like googling the word values and then like choosing from a list right but then we went through this it was a half day kind of exercise where we did this whole sequence of things where it was like hey what situations do you feel like you're able to like step up and lead in or like thrive in what situations do you not feel comfortable in? and then it's like they, they run you through a couple of these kind of exercises where you write down tangible things. And at the end of the day, we had like this list of, of values for, for what we do. I'm curious, what are the values that you want to instill in your kids? Yeah. Well, first, first of all, it's the, the golden rule is to treat people the way that you want to be treated. I think that's the most common one too, that a lot of the dads that I interview will say, and there's nothing more important than that, than to know that when you're not around integrity as well as like when you're not there, that your kids are going to represent the way that you've raised them. I mean, it's so important. And it's usually when I, I coach a lot of kids in a lot of different sports. And the first thing you think of when you see a kid behaving in a certain way is you think of what, what where are the parents there for that kid? What are his parents like? He must, the parents must not be involved. So it, it's important that they represent themselves uh, like good human beings, that they treat other people, all people, the way that they would want to be treated. That's the most important thing. As long as they're good people, that's really the most important value that I hope that they have is that fact of, um, of treating people with fairness and kindness and being able to uh, be there for others. I mean, that's really the most important one. But the other ones, too, uh, like I said, in integrity and to just um, I, I would love for it to be family oriented as well. One of the things in my family is like a lot of the people that don't talk to one another and they have these estranged relationships like they do on my wife's side as well is that they don't allow small disagreements to become these things where they never speak to one another again. So I want to make sure I keep those bonds close with them and remember that they're on the same team, even when things are going difficult with them. I have a question for you, dad to dad. You have four kids. We have two. Ours are way younger. I feel like you have to be with the age of your kids, way more strategic, just them being older. And like they're, they're making a lot of their own choices at this point. How do you go about, you mentioned, you know, uh, uh, your son, who's a chess player, chess or check chess. Chess they're very unique in their own way, right? Whether it be gaming or yeah, they have their own interests, they have their own decision-making processes. How do you cater to that or do you? You got to just support what they're into rather than try to steer them into the, I, which, you know what, uh, you're guilty early on, like, uh, cause I was always a big f- football nut growing up. Like uh, my, me and my brother, we played football. We ate, drank and slept football. We loved it. My older two kids, I tried them in flag football, uh, tried them in basketball and, <laughs> Are they athletes, the older two? I mean, no. uh, so, uh, you know, I tried to give them a taste of it, coached them, got into it, you know, put, put the eye black on, got, you know, but it wasn't for them. Yeah, yeah. What their interests were is what you have got to get behind and rally behind. Like I said, my oldest son is a calculus, a math guy. I couldn't hold a candle to what he knows and he's able to accomplish. So the the sky's the limit for him. So I'm just trying to support him in the best way that I can and help, help guide him through. And obviously unfortunately the part of life is that you have to come across failure and difficulty is the only way to seem to really get any real natural growth in life. So just to be there when those falls happen and kind of tell them like, you know, encourage them, like you can keep going now. That's all right. You know, and hopefully they're few and far between, but hopefully I could be there when that happens. But as far as what they're into, I never played chess ever until uh, my oldest son, Chris got into it and I learned how to play it so that I could bury him in the game. And, it hasn't worked out too well. <laughs> yeah, favorite, I was about but. to say, how's that working out? <laughs> but he's a chess player too. We're all we all play yeah. it now. We all love it. That's great. Um, okay, so you've interviewed all different types of dads, athletes, movie stars, politicians. Is there any genre of like dads who you haven't spoken with yet that you'd like to? Man, that's a good question. I I, I don't really. Th- I mean, I'm open to speak. I want to try to hit all the genres. Like I said, yeah. I've had the best ten pin bowler in the world, yeah. all the way you know to the fisherman. Uh, you know, I I've tried to hit all categories. I don't know if there's really necessary one that eludes me. I've never had a, a professional tennis player. I mean, I would like to try to see if I get. I it just was close there with Divac uh, Djokovic, wow. uh, tr- but I uh, just got just got the, the turn down. But I'm I got the contact, so we'll stay on them. That's <laughs> yeah. for sure. But uh, there, there's you know something yeah. like that I would say, and I'm open to trying to hit them all. You know, that's uh, that's the goal here is to get as many different vibes as I can because when you you can reach a different community, that's the whole idea of it. They, these guys have a huge reach. And I think them speaking about the importance of fatherhood is great for their base because it's going to reach that many more people who are in tuned to what they're saying and they can really have the influence over them. We've mentioned a couple of our favorite interviews that you've done. 
what are some of the ones that uh, there's so many to go through, but what are some of your favorite as far as content? Like, wow, this guy had something really good to say, uh, uh, interviews that you've done. Well, man, as so many people drop so many like wisdom bombs on the show that catch me. But a lot of people will ask me like all these different ones. For me, a personal favorite is, and, and I know I've spoken to you, like I, I love the Navy SEAL community. I'm drawn to that community just because I'm just so mind boggled that we produce men like that in this country. And I'm fascinated by their mindsets. And I bring a lot of them on the show. And my favorite book that I've read in the Navy SEAL genre is Fearless. It's a book about Adam Brown, who was a SEAL Team 6 operator who uh, overcame addiction, lost his eye, lost the use of his shooting hand, and was able to retrain himself and not only be able to do SEAL Team training, but went up and did DevGrew or SEAL Team 6 at the top of the chain and performed at a high level with all overcoming all that. He was killed in action in 2010 in Afghanistan. And I did an interview with his father, Larry Brown from Memorial day two years ago. And it was probably the only time I ever did an interview where I got emotional in the interview. And I felt like I kind of knew Larry a little bit from, I read the book probably like five times, listened to the audio book. And I felt like I, I, I knew what he had been through. And I, I just like, I, I just listening to him speak about his son who was a dad, Adam had two kids and uh, just listening to him talk about who his son was and what he meant to the family and how he wanted to be this father who he, who he was becoming. Uh, what, 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 it was amazing for me. To, and I find, find I kind of felt during the interview, like, man, I don't even know if I should be speaking to him. Like I felt kind of like I was in, I, oh, in over my head, so to speak that, uh, but his, his own story, he's a veteran. He told it so beautifully. It was a great tribute to his son. And it really has a special place in my heart, that interview. So I really encourage people to listen to it. Cause I thought it was really cool. That's great. Aiden, are, is there anyone that you look up to like bath? I know you're a big basketball guy, you're a Bengals fan. Yeah. Do you want your dad to interview anyone in particular? Well, a lot of boxers that I like, like George Foreman, someone he's been trying to have on his show, is someone that I that I like, nice. that I'd like him to interview. There are a few YouTubers. I know a uh, YouTuber, Dan TDM, had had a kid recently. Yeah, you're a big YouTube guy. Yeah, nice. Yeah, my Same. kids they, they do to the YouTube. They ask me, I don't know who these people are, so I got to look into them and reach out. That could be a community I haven't hit. Is gamers? I was close with Tim the Tat Man. He's got some kind of thing going. Yeah. but uh, we'll see if we can make it materialize. That would be super interesting because yeah. I feel like there's a whole kind of stereotype that people put on gamers. But what does their life at home look like? Yeah. Would be super interesting. Um, man, that's good. So, you have your own YouTube channel. Speaking of YouTube called First Class Fatherhood, and joining the Family Made Network. My vision and goal for you and your show, Alec, because we love the message that you're sharing, and I feel like there's so much alignment with the goal of and the belief that, that families and strong families really can impact the world in such an amazing and tangible way. Um, and so my goal is to grow your show, get in front of more people and help you do that in whatever way we can. Um, which we've discussed a lot of different, different ways we can do that, but whether that be taking things off your plate, helping bring in more, uh, sponsors, I'm so excited to see the effect of, of this partnership. And, and, and I really hope that, uh, the effect is to have stronger fathers at the end of the day. And anyway, I just, I, I'm so impressed with what you've built and, I'm talking about your family as well as your show, as well as your career. Like you, you, you're a guy who just goes about things in a deliberate way, which whether I like the style all the time, you know, the Bronx accent for sure is, uh, I love it. I love the accent, but, uh, it's Bronx, right? I'm from. I'm born in the Bronx. Yeah. Is it a Jersey accent? It's, or a, I, it's a North Jersey. Of, uh, it's a potpourri. <laughs> yeah. So, but it, intentionality, I feel like is the key word. Um, so, I thank you for, for joining the show. Glad you brought Aiden. Yeah. You, if you haven't noticed their ties, they are first class fatherhood. Go ahead and flash. It's a that special right edition. That's pretty yeah. NFL all the NFL guys, some of the NFL guys that Alec has out on a show. And then yours is what? This is just like a, a mix of a different guys. They got Tony Hawk on there, uh Jocko, Dana White, uh, Jason Alexander. Or Al Roker. This is just like a potpourri kind of thing. I used that word twice, and it was just kind of weird that I used it <laughs> twice. But, um, yeah, so it's just kind of a mix. I have different yeah. ties. Like, I have a Navy SEAL tie. Uh, uh, you know, I try to cater the tie to the certain event that I'm doing. I brought the backdrop, too, like you'll see. I, I use that because, you know what, the, the people that come on are what make the show. 
And yeah. so I always try to highlight them where I can. I think their message is important. I love what you and Sean do. I think another part of this problem that we're having is so much of the media in this country is so negative, it hits people over the head. And we've become a country that everybody will stop to look at the accident on the side of the road, and nobody is going to stop to take a look at the rose bush that's growing there. And we got to turn that mindset around, too. And that's why I love you guys put out this positive content out there. You don't get into all this blue stuff that's that people, the clickbait that people are looking for. And we need it, man. We need it more than everything. And not only that, the United States, we lead the world in fatherless households. There's no other country that got more fatherless households than we do. And if we can reduce that number and maybe play a small part in it, boy, that would be something, wouldn't it? I'll never forget watching... The social dilemma, which is all about how social media is polarizing our society. And there's a part where I think it was Robert McNamara mentions that we as a society need to find the thing that glues us together and brings us together. And in my mind, that's when it clicked where it was like, it's family. That's the one thing where if you're a Democrat and I'm a Republican and I tell you that I can't make this session because I'm having a kid, you get it. Like, there's no bad blood. You know what I'm saying? Like, you'll support me in, in helping me be there in whatever way possible. And it's like... Family is that glue that there's empathy, there's sympathy, there's understanding all around, and it gets me fired up. So that's the mission. That's the goal. One quick last cl closing question um, for the moms out there who might be single moms. What words of encouragement do you have for them? Because, you know. Well, yeah, that, that's an important question, Andrew, and it is to find a father figure for your son or for your daughter. You really got to find a father figure because it's so important. So many of the dads that I've interviewed – grew up without a father in the home and found that positive fatherhood figure or father figure role model in the military. And it straightened them out. Some of them found it in a coach through a sport yeah, yeah. and it straightened them out. The ones that find it in the street and don't find a positive role model as a male role model for them are why we're filling up the penitentiaries with fatherless kids. All right. So I've spoken to several sheriffs. I spoke to Bernard Carrick, who ran Rikers Island for, for years over there. They see the same thing. Oh, I just did. A, um, oh, boy, the name slipped me. It was a former member of the Colombo crime family. Got a huge YouTube channel. Um, and, really? And, and yeah. Why, why am I slipping? Oh, Michael Francis. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, they have somebody playing his role in Goodfellas. I mean, he wow. was a big time mob guy who turned his life around Christian now does a lot of preaching, does a lot of good in the communities, but he talked about being in the penitentiary. You, he said, you could write the same script for all these guys coming in, follow this household. Mother was working uh, two jobs to try to put food on the table. Couldn't handle the son as he was growing up. He got with the local gang banger. Boom. Here he is in prison. And it's just a repeat cycle. So I would say find positive role models for your sons and for your daughters. It's so imperative. Wow. Well, kudos to you for being that for so many people as you share your content. Aiden, any last words? Uh, yeah. One more thing. My dad reminded me when he said he coached my brothers is that I'm no, I'm no father myself, but... You better uh, not be. <laughs> but something that's, that I think most fathers should do is not only do what your kids want, but show them things uh, that you like to do and you want to do with them. Because even if they're not interested, at least you're trying to see what they're interested in. Like, especially being disciplined and not only just doing, giving them what they want, cheeseburgers and french fries for dinner, but, you know, giving them their vegetables, all that stuff. It's, I think it's very important. I'm going to remember that on Brussels sprout night. <laughs> 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 That's great. Aiden, thanks for joining us. Yeah, it was Alec, great. Thank you. For those listening that want to check out Alex's show called First Class Fatherhood, as well as his book that recently came out with the same name. We'll link that information down below. Alec, thank you again. It's been a pleasure, and I look forward to, to what the future holds. Stoked. I'm stoked, Andrew. I'm honored to be on here, honored to get to work for uh, Family Made. Let's do it. Let's do it, baby.